Are we live? I think we're live. Did we do it? We're on the internet. Welcome to the Start the Clock webinar. The, I'm Patrick Hine. I'm Nate McCarrick. We're going to do a whole lot of stuff in the next 60 minutes. That's right. So let's, uh, as we're waiting for people to filter on in, the latecomers, I'm going to go over a couple of ground rules. So you might recognize Nate and I from training videos. Um, generally speaking, we go at a very decisive and slow pace so that you can all learn. But that's not really the, um, the purpose of today's webinar. Today's webinar is all about proof of concept, proving that QSIS is a software-based control platform and showing that with a little bit of control knowledge, you could add an entire room full of design uh, elements to an existing conference room. Now, we are in a conference room right here. We're broadcasting from one of our conference rooms here at our uh, headquarters in Costa Mesa. However, we are not going to be connecting to all the devices that are in this room, right? We've got a TV that's already mounted on the wall. We've got microphones and the tables. That's not what we're connecting with. We don't want to make it look like we're, uh, we're cheating by connecting to things that have already been installed. We're pretty much going to be pulling everything out of the box, essentially, and putting it right in front of you. We're going to have a big old pile of junk right in front of Patrick uh, and, and doing it from as, as bare bones as possible. Uh, speaking, so Nate mentioned, again, this is live, so if you have questions, we actually have two different product managers online right now to answer any questions, and we might answer one or two questions live on the air. Um, and uh, let's look around the room real quick while we're filling in. Yeah, exactly. Got, yeah, got, let's, hi, camera there. Yeah. Hi, camera there. How are you? Hi, camera. <laughs> let's say hi over here to Siobhan. She'll be helping uh, answer questions and uh, you know time our stuff. Speaking of answering questions, um, we actually have a couple of product managers on hand. So we want your participation as much as humanly possible. Uh, go ahead and just, uh, there should be a little chat window at the bottom right-hand corner of your window. So you do need to log in with either Facebook or Vimeo, or you can just log in as a guest. Just put your name in, and uh, you'll be able to ask the experts questions. And hopefully, um, we will be able to take a couple of these live. And if not, we are going to be sending out an FAQ at the, s at the end of this webinar with everybody's questions answered. Whether we got to it live or via text or not, you'll get the answers to all of your questions. We promise. So do we get started? Let's get started. Uh, first of all, take a look at what we have out here we've just got just a core core 110f that's going to be what we'll be using for our control processor uh here on top of that we just have a switch um, it's not just any switch though what are you talking about well it may look like a normal dell switch but this is actually a qsys ns switch which is a pre-configured switch for qsys so if you want an out-of-the-box solution or you're just kind of you're nervous about configuring QoS, this is a great solution for somebody who's relatively new to networking and, and wants to dive in right away. And you can see there's only two cables connected to that. One is going to the core, one of them is going to my laptop, and my laptop will be running everything else. Right, so uh, let's get started. Um, we're gonna be controlling a bunch of different things in the room, and we wanna show uh, you how the end user will eventually control those things. So let's start with a control panel. Nice and easy, we're gonna grab one of our QSC touch screen and connected through the PoE port on the switch. This is an example of a native QSYS device, which means that there is literally no programming to drag and drop controls from your schematic library onto this d device. So all I do is plug it right into this PoE switch. And it should be coming online momentarily. So let's swap over to my desktop so we can see what we're going to do. Now, again, we're not going to be hiding anything. I'm going to open a brand new instance of designer software. Nothing has been built already. Uh, this is a fresh, fresh design. I'm going to, first of all, connect to my core. If I go to my configurator window, then I can see all the devices that are on my network. My core is called 110F-Training. Uh, and I am going to simply take that copy that name, and place it into my core's properties. Uh, you can also see that my TSC80 just showed up as it was identified through the discovery protocol on the network. So I'm going to add an inventory item with my TSC80 as a peripheral. You might notice that we've got several touchscreens to choose from, not just the 8-inch. We also have a 5.5-inch available and an 11-inch. And once these are these devices are named properly, then when I connect to the core for the first time, it will search them out and deliver that design to them. Uh, before I do that, however, I am going to close the configurator and create a new user control interface. And I'm going to name this interface uh, Start the Clock, because that's the name of our webinar. 
Uh, and by creating it, <clears throat> I can now go to my inventory and tell my touch screen to display this particular UCI when it does boot up. Now, now, one of the cool things about designing a UCI within QCIS Designer software is that you're never leaving that software suite between your DSP configuration and your UCI design. So you're just dragging and dropping things like uh, controls or potentially images, right? Never leaving the same the that software. You know, so you're not learning two different software suites, and you're never leaving that software suite either. Now you may see that I've, I've added some layers to my UCI. I know that we're going to be controlling a camera later. We're going to be controlling some environmental controls. We're going to be controlling uh, the video options in the room and a background layer as well. These are going to operate as my different pages as we build along. Um, oop, I misspelled background. Background. <laughs> background. Uh, and I am going to add an image to my background. You have the ability to add um, all kinds of different um, art files. So I'm going to... Go and grab a background that we created for this. And you can see it's literally just drag and drop. You can add um, almost any type of standard graphic file, whether that be a PNG or a JPEG, wh whatever you Basically, anything that you can grab from the internet. I yeah. actually think that you can do certain vector graphics too, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll, in fact, I'll grab this. Um, I'll grab this PNG for you with a logo of the room. We'll put that in the corner, something like that. Um, but I'm going to lock that background right now because we're going to add stuff to these pages so that we can uh, control some things. Let's control our first thing. In fact, let's time how long it takes us to control things. So uh, what do we want to build first, and how are we going to do it? Uh, I would love for us to start uh, easy. Let's start on that, that TV back there. So let's say that you've got a commercial screen back there that, generally speaking, usually has uh, a network port. And we don't want to just control it with a simple remote control, we want QSIS to be able to control that, yeah. right, Nate? So I'm going to power it on. And one thing that is nice about this particular brand is that when you do power it on, it gives you an IP address right at the top of it. I need that IP address in order to talk to it with one of our plugins. So I'm going to use that back here in the software. So a plugin is one of the easiest ways uh, you can uh, connect to a third-party device because it's just like pulling a native uh, device out of the inventory, same as you were doing something that was built inside of QSIS already. And I'm going to plug this into the network. Patrick's going to plug us in uh, from the cable all the way into our switch. Here in the software, I am going to go to our plugins directory. And in plugins, you can see currently I have nothing installed there. Uh, but I'm going to go to the Asset Manager, which is our online database, the library of available plugins listed by manufacturer. I will search for NEC as a device. And sure enough, the multi-sync display is one of those available. You know, by virtue of, uh, again, the Asset Manager is a, is a live library. So for example, if we were to update this NEC screen with a new plugin, you could use the Asset Manager to just grab the latest version and pop it right into a design. So I've added that multi-sync display plugin into the schematic. I made a little space for myself so I, I know what I'm looking for. And if we open up the plugin, we'll actually see that it looks a lot like the, uh, the TV controller that you just saw live. A lot of these plugins are uh, they're crafted in such a way that they will resemble the actual device. So I'm going to want to grab the power toggle. That's a good button to have. Let's grab uh, like the up and the down channel buttons. We probably want the volume up and down buttons. I'm just pulling them into the design right now because I know I'm going to want these. Uh, in fact, I think I'll grab them all and I'll make them of a uniform size. Um, maybe I'll make them 75 by 75 so they're square. It's a little large, but uh, you know, just gives me a starting place. I can quickly pack these next to each other um, and reorient them like so. And that's a little bit nicer. And the power button, too. I'll probably make that a little bit larger. Nice. All right. So what I want to do is save this to the core and run. All we have to do is tell the plugin to connect to the proper device. Like I said, we got the IP address from uh, the device already when it booted on. Back to the screen, Jason. So I'm going to look inside, and we need to input that IP address, which was 192. Whoops. How about if I type that properly? 192.168.1.182. And I will hit the connect. It'll look out in the network. It found one. Uh, and then we'll swap back to our screen here in real time. And looking, oh, I'm, I should probably put it on our screen if I want to make something Oops. work. Uh, like I said, I pulled these into my design. So why don't I copy these buttons and actually put them onto the UCI? We'll put these on the video page. Perfect. And oh, now I need to make them a little bit larger. 
And that is the design that we will push to the core. A little bit later, if we have time, we'll arrange these so they look um, a little bit nicer on the screen. Right now, I'm just kind of throwing buttons on there. Um, but we want to make sure that it works. So right now, the core is pushing those images, and there's the things that Nate just built in that. Let's go to camera one so we can get both of these on screen at the same time. There's our TV. There's our button. I hit the button. Boom! Power's off. Ta-da! We have control. And stop the clock. Let's go over to our official timekeeper, Siobhan, and we can get our time. Three minutes, 32 seconds. Three and a half minutes. That was pretty good. And again, that was zero programming. Nate was literally just dragging and dropping things, grabbing something that's from our live directory, and then loading it onto the screen. Very, very simple. What's next? Um, well, let's take a look. Uh, what about microphones? So What about microphones? That's, a gr gr that's your angle, Nate. That's perfect. Uh, well, uh, we said that we weren't going to do any audio, but I w every once in a while you've got these kinds of LEDs that you can use to indicate either that microphone's muted or if it's offline or whatever, and I would love to take control of this. Uh, I know that this has got a GPIO connection, and our core processor has... GPIO on the back. Correct. So uh, while Patrick plugs it into the back of the core, yep. let's take a look at the software. Uh, I will once again make a little room for myself. We're going to call this mic control. Uh, I know that these are going to be coming in as Patrick plugs them into mic line in channels one through three. Uh, there's three elements inside this particular microphone. Uh, and then we're going to grab GPIO in and GPIO out. Uh, whether or not you want to fight me on whether that should sh simply be GPI or GPO. I don't want that fight. General purpose input and general purpose output, whereas GPIO in makes it sound like an ATM machine, which is redundant. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the GPIO in one and change this to a contact closure input. So that's the type of connection we're bringing in from the device. Yep. So when that is triggered, I'm going to start a signal tag, and I'll just call this the mute button. So that when this comes in, it initiates a mute, which I can deliver to many other places. Uh, for instance, I will expose the mute control for channels 1, 2, and 3. And that will allow me to take this one input, and copy it in all three of those places, so it'll mute those channels when it does get there. Uh, I am also going to deliver that to our output channel uh, because we have the ability to send a signal to uh, the device, and that is going to change the LED on the display ring so that we will get some sort of visual feedback that it's working. Uh, I'm going to change the color to all these mutes to red because clearly mute is red. Yeah. And obviously, you know, if this were wired into the design, the audio pins would be going somewhere, but we're not doing that right now. Yep. Let us uh, save that to the core and run. And then we should be able to make this work both in the real world and here in the software. Uh, first thing we will have to do is give it phantom power. If you see this in the real world right now, that ring is still nothing. It's not lighting up at all. Uh, but in the software, I can go to the phantom power um, button for these three channels. I'm going to turn it on for all three. Now in the real world, there it is. We have a red light because it's currently engaged. Press it again, goes green, and it is disengaged. And all of our mutes are off or on accordingly. That's pretty exciting. Take a look at it inside the software, Patrick. Yep. Press the button. Boom. See all our Boom. mutes turn on. All Boom. Our mutes turn off. Piece of cake. That Man. was too easy. What, what, I, I, stop that clock. Yeah, stop what that clock, it? Siobhan. What, what, do we, what do you got over there? Two minutes, 51 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I love the pose, too, before you gave that time. Thank you. Less than three minutes, and we got mic control. What's next? Make it harder. Come all on. right, all right. So let's say that you're working with maybe the most not the most modern conference room, and they still, for some reason, want a DVD player. I don't know. Maybe they got an old version of 300 that they want to play. I, 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 don't, I don't really know. 300 is not even that old. Well, <laughs> that's the only DVD that I have in my collection. Got it. So uh, let's assume that you've got a commercial DVD player, and you want to bring it in. So I'm going to go grab this one over here. This, uh, in addition to uh, you know the regular ins and out, has a serial port on the back. So you can see that right there. Let's, get, let's hit uh, Jacob's camera right there. And it just so happens that we have an RS-232 uh, controllable output on our core. All right. So, so this is since this right is there. not a networked device, we have to connect it to it in a different way. Correct. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's still not that hard. This is one of the ones that we can use a command button for. So let's look at the software while Patrick plugs all that in. 
Uh, I am going to return to my software. We're going to add a section that's called DVD. Actually, I'm going to call this uh, Sparta Control in honor of 300. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and what I want to do is I want to grab, let's grab the command buttons. Command buttons are right down here in the control components section. These allow you to send a simple string to a device. Uh, now that could be a TCP connection. If you did have a network device, you just know that IP address and send it. But in our case, it's going to be a serial connection. And when we see that serial connection, we get this little trapezoidal pin on the command buttons, which can only be wired to the serial port of a, another device. So. Here's our wired connection internally to QSIS. Uh, Patrick has made the physical connection out there in the real world. Yep. Uh, I'm going to open up this section. I know in here I need to configure it properly. I need to give it the right baud rate and parity for this serial device. I'm here I'm going to input the command that needs to be sent, and then when I press this button, that command will be sent. So first I'm going to grab this button, we'll drop it onto our UCI, and that way I've got it all ready for us. We'll make it a little bit larger. And we're going to have this button be the one that opens and closes the tray, the, the, the disk tray. So open. So small. Close tray. And clearly, like Patrick said, we need a larger font for that. Let's make it something like 32. That looks better on a nice font. I'm going to round out the edges just a little bit. That's a little bit prettier. Uh, but that's the easy part. What's the hard part? The hard part is figuring out what to input here. So how do we know what the baud rate is? How do we know what command we need to send for this device? Nate, I hear the internet has things. I hear the internet has things. That sounds like an easy way to get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> What what's uh, what do you want to find on the internet? Well, I, I feel like if you went searching for, I'm looking for the things. Yeah, I, for things. I want you to search for this device. That it's a Tascam. Okay. DV dash. DV. D zero one. Dash D zero one. U. U. Okay. Well, I had a lot of hits on it. Let's see what we find. Uh, let's go to their uh, their website right there, and here's that is the device. All right, let's so see let's if we can find a manual for yeah. it. Uh, hey, download the manual. Perfect. So uh, we we will give a disclaimer that obviously not all um, not all manufacturers are created equal. So you might have to go digging a little bit for this particular information. So I would either check the index, obviously, or do a quick find in uh, on like RS two thirty two and see where it brings you. I can see that they've got a RS two thirty two interface right here. So I'm gonna scroll down, see if I can find here. These look like commands. Here it is, RS two thirty two. So it's here's where some people might get easily thrown. And I understand that this can this can kind of be um, a little daunting for some people. Here it's going to tell me, you know, a couple different things. It says here's the code you want to enter, but then there's this, all this other gobbledygook underneath it. Well, when you want to send commands, like if the command is PLY for play, unfortunately you can't just type in PLY. You've got to deliver it in a language that the uh, receiving device understands. And in this particular device, it understands hexadecimal code. So it gives us the translation for these right here. It says, here's your play command, and here's what it looks like in hex. Uh, but even this may still not be what you're looking for. Let me zoom in a little bit. Because you can't just type in 02H, 3EH, 50H. That's not, that doesn't make sense on the, on the uh, QSIS side of things. Because QSIS is using Lua as a language, and it needs to be able to translate code into hex in a slightly different way. So in order to do that, we are going to have to use its protocol, which is something called backslash x. Uh, so I'm going to throw my, uh, my commands on one side of the screen, and I'll open up QSIS on the other side. And uh, let's look for our open, oh, it's right there, open, close, disk tray. Here are the commands we need to enter. I'm going to translate them over here into Lua by using backslash x and then the code it w it it's asking for. So 02H turns into backslash x02. Uh, 3EH turns into backslash x3E. And Patrick, can you just read these out for me so I don't have to go back and forth? Certainly. 4D. 4D. 4, 4, 5. 4, 5. 4, 4. 4, 4. 6, 3. 6, 3. 4, 5. 4, 5. 4A. 4A. 4, 3. 4, 3. 2, 0. 2, 0. 2, 0. 2-0. Okay, and then there's one last thing we need to do at the end of any of these strings is to add a carriage return. That's a, basically the equivalent of hitting enter, uh, and that is going to be represented with backslash 
are. So that is one of the most commonly missed things when people are trying to communicate with third-party devices, whether that's TCP or serial, is you need some sort of end-of-line character, like a carriage return or a line feed uh, that will uh, terminate the command. So I have done that. Uh, I have, I'm saved to the core and run. Uh, oh, you know what I didn't mention was, and let me look back here in the manual really quickly. Uh, I didn't mention that in this particular device, it was actually just kind of coincidental that uh, the default um, uh, bit rate parity was the same thing uh, that we needed. So we saw that we have a data rate of 9600, character length 8 bits, no parity, stop is 1 bits. That was actually just quite conveniently how our command buttons come as default. So I didn't need to update these fields for this particular device. Anyways, we should be ready to go. Back to the live stuff. Jacob, hit me with this one and get this in this in frame. We've got an open close tray button. Press the button. Bam! Huzzah! Sh Look at just that easy. Siobhan, stop that clock. We need to know how long that was. Six minutes, 56 seconds. That was a little longer than I thought. Well, I mean, we did a lot of grabbing of codes and putting them into the software. You know, it, sometimes it does take a little bit of time to transcribe that information. Obviously, if we were going to do more, like we want the play button, the fast forward button, you'd be doing the, a couple more of those. But right. you can see that it wasn't that bad to just find the information and send it to the device. Right. Uh, okay. So that was a little bit of a little bit of programming. Let's kind of circle back around to native control. Um, so we have uh, our touchscreen right here, which is obviously a native control, but we have lots of other QSIS peripherals that you can draw from that, again, don't require any programming whatsoever. So we're in a conference room, and we need cameras. So let's grab the QSIS PTZ IP camera. Now, you might notice that, again, I said this was a PT. Uh, a PTZ IP camera. So there is only one connection for uh, all, uh, the video, the data, and the control. So a single cable to do all of that. And again, there is no programming to get this up and running. It's literally just a drag and drop ep exercise. I'm going to get this hooked up, Nate. Now, you they, 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 you, since you showed that to them, zoom in on that one more time. Uh, there is also an HDMI and an SDI. There are other outputs as well, but that we're not going to use those. We're only using the Cat5 right. cable in this right. instance because uh, those are just courtesy outputs if you wanted to route them somewhere else. In the exactly. Room. We only need one, uh, one cable, provided it is PoE. Yep. Uh, as he plugs that in, let's look at the software. So, once again, I'm going to make a space for myself. We'll call this one camera control. And this is a native device, so it's going to be really easy. We're just going to go to the inventory. We're going to add a PTZ 12 by 72 camera. That's this model. You'll notice uh, as it gets power, it's booting up on its own. It's looking right at me. Really creepy. Uh, I'm going to drag in the status control block and open that one up. I haven't connected yet, so I don't see any activity, but I know I'm going to need this block here. This is a preview window with some pan, tilt, and zoom controls on it. So I'm going to grab those and move them onto my UCI. I'll put them on the camera layer this time, and I'll make them a little bit larger. That should give us all the control that we need. Uh, by this point, we can probably find this device in the configurator. So I'll go back to the configurator. There it is. There's my camera, and its name happens to be camera-training. So that's the name I need to provide for it over here in the properties, yeah. camera-training. Uh, and then the last thing I want to do is I want to make sure that it is doing something in my design. So I've brought in this camera, but I want to deliver it to an endpoint. And now the endpoints that we're going to be using are USB bridge endpoints. And uh, this would be something that is delivered to a PC in the room or a uh, laptop that's on the desk. Uh, you can find, you can add that bridge uh, through one of our uh, dedicated USB bridging peripherals, or there's one that's right here on the core itself. So I'm going to add a video bridge and wire my camera to it. If I wanted to, I could uh, add multiple cameras into this design. I could just grab a uh, camera router and put in multiple cameras in and then send it out. But we only have the one, so I'm going to delete that right now. Let's, uh, let's, jump, let's jump live. Patrick's got to plug in his laptop. Yep. So we're going to finish this bridge in the real world by coming out of the back of the core and into his laptop through the USB connection. And that way, if he's running Skype or WebEx or GoToMeeting or whatever it is his teleconferencing suites of choice is, it will see that video bridge as just a native webcam and say, hey, you want to use this as your webcam? Yeah. It, it it's up. important to note, too, that literally there's no uh, drivers that I'm installing this. This is a universal USB connection, so universal audio and video. Plugs into any laptop and delivers audio and video. 
without driver install. And so by this point, in. our design is up and running, so you can see if we zoom in on our screen. Here is that, uh, that preview window that I showed you earlier. You may think to yourself, hey, it looks a little bit choppy. Again, this is just a one JPEG per second preview window. Uh, but you can see, pull out a little bit so you can actually see the camera itself. I can fully control the camera using those controls. And there is what the actual feed looks like as in the uh, camera app or teleconferencing app. Hit this real uh, close, Jacob. In the real world. So looking pretty good. Maybe, I, maybe I, no, you stay where you are. I'm going to zoom in on you. No, fair enough. You keep, you keep right where you are. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Hello. That's looking like your nostrils. So close. No. Um, we're keeping it right there. This is ah, look at that no. autofocus, too. All right. Anyways, so stop the clock. That was our camera. How, how long did that take us? Four minutes and 14 seconds. Four That's minutes and 14 seconds. He didn't even have to eat a burrito. <laughs> I'm, I'm disappointed, actually. All right, so are you ready for the next thing? No. Okay. I lied. What's up? Okay. Uh, so we have positioned ourselves very strategically in front of this shade control. It's a pretty, um, pretty standard sh shade control, and it doesn't have uh, an internet connection, or uh, pardon me, an ethernet connection. Now, so I, we did say that we weren't going to control anything in the room earlier. We did lie about the shades because we didn't have we didn't have the ability to put a somehow a shade control right here. So I didn't lie. So we pulled the we pulled the gimbals out to get access to that one. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so if we don't have a plug-in for a particular device, we might have a plug-in for a device that can talk to that device. Yep. I want to show you something about um, called the Global Cache. This is a, a good little uh, manufacturer. I probably shouldn't call them little. They're a big manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, that makes little devices, uh, like this guy right here. Look at this cute little thing. What it does is it just gives us the ability to send relays to another third-party device by sending that Global Cache commands uh, over the network. So this device has got the uh, the Cat5 connection, and it's basically just sending a simple connection to the shade control. Correct. So I'm going to get that plugged into our switch. Well, uh, we take a look at my software. Yep. So let's take a look here. I'm going to call this one Shade Control. I once again need a plug-in, so I'll go to the Asset Manager. And we'll search for Global Cache as a manufacturer. There we go. Uh, right now, I'm going to install this one, the Contact Closure Relay. Uh, you can actually even see this is the device. That's the device Patrick showed you just momentarily. So I'll install this plugin. Never takes more than a couple seconds to install. While I'm here, I'm going to also install the control tower. Oh, you know what? I didn't show that in our earlier, um, our earlier webinar. I'm going to make sure to show it this time. Um, install both of these. And I just kind of want to show you something fancy that Global Cache can do just a little bit later. All right, so here we go. I'm going to add my relay device here. Uh, inside of it, uh, there are three buttons for the three controls on that device. So I'll put those onto my environmental layer here on the UCI. I don't know which one is up and which one is down, so I won't, I won't label these yet, but let's just put the buttons there. Uh, and then I will save the corn run. Now this one is super nice because it just automatically works no matter what. Um, it's just it'll search out that device, and I can I don't need to put in, in uh, an IP address or anything like that. Um, but here in the in the software, I do need to make sure I am connected, so uh, I can see that it found one on the network. That is in fact the serial device of ours. Bam. Easy. Uh, I hit connect. It is connected. Cool. Let's go to the real world. Uh, and then again, I don't know which one's which. This might be up. Yay! Hey! Hey! The shades are going up. Uh, let's go down. Yep, that looks that like down to me. You might say oh, that. I, stop! Stop! I don't want to crush the plant. You might say <laughs> that you're casting shade, throwing shade. Is that what the kids say? Uh, the kids don't say it. Um, oh. the kids, the kids. Uh, you, I. I tried to make shade reference. Yeah, you said the word shade. That's pretty much as close as you got towards anything resembling either kids you're or a reference. You're welcome. Casting shade. That's just what the sun does when you're standing in front of it in an object. I heard it on Jeopardy. Throwing shade was what you were going for, okay, but it's more. Of, it's more like this. Oh. That's throwing shade. I'm gonna take a note. The kids are all going crazy now for my shade look. What was the time on that? <laughs> Well, it probably would have been a lot faster, <laughs> but I'd say three minutes and 30 seconds. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Three and a half. With that extra 30 seconds, I want to show you something else that Global Cache can do. Uh, so I showed you that control tower thing. This is super cool. Uh, grab control tower. If you want to connect to something that's using an IR device, uh, then here's what you might use. 
uh, because you can have you can look at Global Cache's uh, library of their devices, and they have tons and tons. So looking in the control tower, I'll go to their online database and connect to the database. Once it uh, goes out and reaches to the internet and finds all the possible manufacturers, I will be able to select from those possible manufacturers in the brand name section right here. So another couple seconds should be logged in. There it is. I will scroll through these brands, and you may notice that there's so many brands. I believe the correct number is eight trillion. Is that right? Eight well, trillion brands. I looked it up in the press release. Uh -huh. we, they actually give us access to over two hundred thousand devices. Two hundred thousand. devices. That is a very cramped meeting room. Uh, so yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna grab something that we'll probably know. How about Apple? We'll go sure. Apple, and I will choose uh, a media manager. We'll grab an Apple TV. So what we do is we then uh, we get this code set that installs it into our local database. Now that it's saved in our local database, so it's always a part of Designer. You don't need to go online anymore. Uh, I can pull up that code set. We'll just copy this into our uh, IR version over here into that um, code set uh, receptacle. So now any of the buttons inside of this can accept um, commands for uh, an Apple TV. Let me zoom in a little bit. I know this is a little bit hard to see. So, for instance, this button is going to access the Apple TV code set for uh, the menu button. And this one's going to activate the command set for the uh, play and pause. And Got then it. these buttons automatically up here will now do that for you. Let me just let me add their names to it. And these are the buttons that you would put on your UCI. Super easy. You have access to uh, what, uh, hundreds of thousands of different devices. Right. It's, it's, it's a really good companion piece, piece for QSIS because QSIS lives and breathes in the IP, and this is kind of the bridge for those that don't. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have any of those devices to actually connect to right now, so yeah. we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next real device. What's our, what's our so you device? know you can't cast shade without light. Okay. <laughs> I'm going the with it. The harshest <laughs> transition. I'm going to put that on record. The <laughs> hardest transition in You're welcome. broadcasting. Anyway, so we have light that we want to control in yep. the conference room. So I am going to grab a very common lighting apparatus. This is a Lutron controller that is controlled over IP. So I'm going to plug that in right now. And... We do have a plugin for this, or we ha we don't have a plugin for this. But what do we have for this? Yeah, Nate? we d the, the problem is we don't have a plugin, and some devices if we don't have a plugin for, you're like, what do I do? But there are tons and tons of what we call user components, which is sort of like a plugin. It's just a, a, a an, an, an interactive um, control panel that someone has built. Sometimes our engineers build them. Sometimes they're built by uh, the manufacturer itself. Sometimes some other engineer out there has made them. And we have tons of these available through our applications engineering team that we could distribute to you. Now, they're not necessarily fully vetted. They're not like a thousand percent foolproof, but most of the time they are exactly what you're looking for. And actually, most of the time they are in transition to plugins. I will say, though, in order for us to cast shade, so, uh, we're see, going to good, need right? a, something more than these empty holes to actually make the light happen. So, uh, Patrick's going to pull over this. Um, we stole it from Frankenstein's laboratory <laughs> last I checked. Bam! This is the oldest possible uh, lighting uh, instrument we could well, listen, design. We wanted to make sure that the people knew that we weren't cheating on this, so this is the best way to do it. So we'll plug in those three lights to those three controllers inside uh, the Lutron. While we're looking at this, I want, uh, I want uh, Jacob, can you zoom in on here? This is what the device looks like. We've got some five presets on the side. We've got some manual control over here. Right now, if it's all plugged in properly, I can do this manually. I can hit the first presets and the lights, as you can see. If we zoom out just a bit, they are all on. They can be controlled individually by these buttons on the device. We're now going to replicate that um, inside the software. So like I said, user components. Right now, I have nothing in my user components section over Boo. here. Boo. Uh, but I did get this one from a, one of our friendly apps engineers. So I'm going to grab this, um, com this uh, file right here, the Lutron Graphic Eye. I'll go to the Documents folder in my laptop go into the user components folder and just paste it. Once it's there, it's instantly and readily available in the software. I can just drag that in. And if we look at it, again, kind of like plugins, it's been designed to look a lot like that actual device. Here's those five Let's presets on again. the side. There are those three uh, buttons on the side. There you go. Just like we saw. So I'm going to take my five buttons, and I'm going to place those onto our UCI. Again, on the environmental controls uh, layer that we established for ourselves. 
and I'm going to save the core and run. Uh, of course, kind of like the other plugin that we use with the uh, the global cache, we do have to discover this and then connect to it. So back in the software, I'm going to look for its name on the network. It found it. There, ours, this one is called Lower Room. I know that's the serial code. Uh, so it is now connected. It, uh, yep, it's connected properly. Let's look over here on our actual touch screen. Uh, just like I just did manually over here, I should be able to press that button and... Voila. Voila! Lights are on. I have individual control of each one if I want to just turn one on or a different one on. Siobhan, stop that clock. I think we're done with this one. Where are we at? Okay, that was three minutes and 32 seconds. That was pretty fast. I'm, I'm going to uh, reiterate that again. If you're looking for a device that we don't have a plug-in for, uh, I would contact either your local QSC sales director or an application engineer. And we have a whole library of these that we can draw from. Uh, they're just not uh, ready for the... Pro, uh, the plugin library, but they are ready to be distributed. Yeah. What's next? Okay. Uh, I so we're in a video scenario. We've already got control of our screen, but let's say that we've got multiple input devices. Now, if you were a couple months from now, and you might uh, you might have ordered a new NV series video endpoint, uh, which could do some switching for you in addition to videos transport, but we're not there yet. Um, so let's take a really simple. Uh, IP-based switching device uh, for HDMI. Okay. So I've got this Atlona Juno over here that we can control with a plug-in because it's super fast, Nate. All right, so first let's do the, the physical side of it. Yeah. Our TV is over here. It's running. It's got some media that is currently playing. I just booted it up again using our buttons. Uh, that is playing these uh, these people. I'm going to take this. is our, Here's the media drive on the ground. I'm going to disconnect... And we'll take the TV. We'll now get its input from the Atlona HDMI switcher. You got it. I'm going to grab the media player that was providing that content, and we'll make that connected on one of these sources. Do you have an HDMI cable for me? I do. We right have here. two sources now. One source is playing one of Patrick and I, one of our videos, and the second one will play an, another video so we can toggle back and forth. I'm just plugging in down here. And, boop, doop, 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 and that. Oh, no. I got down. it. And that is connected. So physically, this should be all we need. Uh, if we see the TV, then we have source one as one of our options. And we can now toggle to another input on at Lona. And now we have source two as a different option. Piece of cake. Um, but we want to do that virtually. We want to have QSYS in those commands, right? Yep. So in order to make that happen, we're going to connect a Cat5 cable from our switch to at Lona. Let's do it. Grab a cable for me. And we could use a plugin. We have a plugin for this. But how much time do we have, Siobhan? How much time do we have left on this? You have about 23 minutes. We got 23 minutes. So We've already connected time. like seven devices in 33 minutes, whatever. I'm going to make this one a little bit harder. We're going to pretend we don't have a plugin for this. What if you have a device that we have no plugin? There's no global cache equivalent. You can't figure it out. You can use scripting to make more complicated connections between people. Uh, now, if you really want to learn a lot about scripting, uh, you can uh, go to our online training classes. Control 101 will give you the basics of uh, scripting and block controller, which is our visual coding scripting tool. Uh, you could also uh, take our in-classroom session called Control 201, which goes an extra couple steps beyond that. Um, I'm going to not teach you any scripting. I'm going to show you the scripting because, again, that's the whole point of this webinar. But once you are amazed by what you see, we encourage you to go do that training. Obviously. So I'm going to make another space for myself. This is going to be our video router control. And I'm going to go to the scripting components branch of our schematic elements library and grab in a block controller. Uh, and I'll zoom in a little bit over here. The block controller is, like I said, it's our visual coding arena. We are going to add a couple of uh, elements into it. First of all, I want a button that is going to change us to source one. So that's going to be a trigger button. I'm going to add another control that will change us to source 2. That is also going to be a trigger button. I'm also going to add a connection, because I need to communicate with a TCP socket to that device. And by adding that, I've created it. So let's go into the edit field for our block controller. Uh, here's our controls. When control 1 is pressed, then this block is going to be initiated. So when control 1 has been uh, has received a change, it will do a thing. The thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to send a write command to our connection. 
So looking in our connection, here is our first block that will write a command. Uh, what is the command that we're going to send? Well, kind of similar to what we did earlier with the DVD player. You would have to find that device's uh, manual, maybe hunt around to find out what its string and send commands are. This one I've worked with a couple times before, so I just know it off the top of my head. The write code happens to be uh, x1, av, x1, and then, much like before, carriage return. That's a backslash r. So I've put that in there for my first button. I'm going to just copy and paste this whole block, and we're going to make it true for our second control. And that is a slightly different command. It's going to be x2 avx1. Uh, and then I also just want to make sure that I've got a little bit of feedback in my system so that when, uh, when I press a button, I have proof that it worked, that the, the script's reporting back to me what it's doing. So I'm going to add uh, a debug print, just shove it into these blocks. Just best practice. Yeah. That way that uh, I will know that, uh, you know, button was, or button one was pressed. So if something doesn't go wrong, I just kind of have a nice way of troubleshooting at what point it went wrong. Oh, I don't need that. I just need... Hey, delete that. Just need button. Two was pressed. And then other obvious um, best practices is that if the device itself is sending me information, I want to know about it. So when the connection receives a message, with uh, and I'll choose any as my end of line table, I'm going to display that message. I'm just going to put it in my debug window. So that's the entirety of the block programming. You can see it's just three blocks, very few uh, things I had to customize in each of them. Let's make sure that we grab the controls themselves. And I'm going to end up putting these onto my UCI. Love it. So that goes on to the video page, because this is going to be changing our sources. Oh, they're so small. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to. I'm going to stack these on top of each other and make them quite a bit larger. Uh, they're, you know, one's for source one, one's for source two. Uh, and that should be, once we connect, all we have to do. Uh, the last step, of course, is to make sure that we have the correct uh, IP address and the correct port that we're going to communicate on. Very similar to what we did for the, you know, the baud rate and the parity for that DVD player. We, that's information that you can you'll be able to configure the IP address on your own, and the port is something that you'll need to find yep. from the manufacturer. I know that mine happens to be, uh, the port is 23. The IP address is 192.168.1.183. And you can see once I've entered that, it g goes to a green OK status. If we go to the live footage of our actual touchscreen, if we can see that with the screen in the background at the same time, then I should be able to, oops, I may have, uh, we're currently on source two. So if I go to source one, Ta-da! Oh! It worked. It toggled over to our other media source. Amazing. And I can go back again. So we're Ooh. done, right? So what's the time on that? Seven minutes and ten seconds. So we're done, right? Seven minutes and ten we're seconds so done. for a device you had to script for. That was too easy. Thank you for coming too to the easy. webinar. What? Too easy. We're going to make it harder. No. What if you didn't have block controller? What if you had to really dig deep and use some coding? We're going to write You have to be a really smart person, right? You don't have to be a smart person because I can do this. Burn on you. Take that, me. All right. So I'm going to do this exact same thing one more time. Rather than block controller, I am going to use uh, our Lua scripting engine. Yep. So we're going to grab a text controller instead. The text controller is like the block controller. It allows you to add controls. I'm going to once again add two different control types. We'll call the first button source1, and it'll be a trigger. And then I'm going to add another one that's called source2. And that is also a trigger. And again, we'll put both of these buttons onto our UCI. I'll d delete those block controller ones and paste these guys instead. And this time, all you got to do is go into, I don't need that, I don't need that. All you got to do is go into the edit button of the Lua and then just type in the scripts that um, would make this thing work. That's it. You're done. Just type in some Lua. Oh. Easy peasy. Uh, now, if you don't know Lua off the top of your head, well, then that big black void of death could look pretty intimidating. Uh, again, if you go to our classes, you can learn them. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that you don't even necessarily need to always know that stuff because we give you some of that in the help pile. So back here, I'm going to delete my magic stuff. Let's go to the help file. I know that I'm looking for TCP socket. 
TCP socket is the connection that's going to be made for a TCP device. I go to TCP socket, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and we have some example scripts that are already functional. So I'm going to grab this entire script right here, and I will paste that into my Lua scripting edit window. Uh, I, there are a couple of things I need to edit. It's not going to magically work off the bat, so you obviously need to know a little bit. Uh, I need to correct the IP address, which is 183. I need to adjust the port number, which for this device is 23. And then down here at the bottom, let me zoom in a little bit. Down here at the bottom, this is what's happening when the button is pressed. So right now, when input one control is engaged, its event handler creates a function that writes data on this connection. So I need to do one, a couple of different things. I need to make sure I'm targeting the right control. I need my control source one. And I need to make sure that the data that's being sent is the right data, which you'll feel remember was x1 av x1 carriage return. That is all I need to do for that first button. I'm going to copy this and then paste it below. And we'll update it so that um, it makes sense for our second control, which is source 2. And we're going to activate input 2. Uh, and then like we did earlier, if, if I want to add a debug print, I can make sure that this says you know, source 1 is active. Uh, and I'll put that down here as well. So that as, uh, as the script runs, we have some track of what's happening. So that's all that I really had to write right for Lua. Uh, let's see if it works. We're going to save this to the core. And this should work the same way that the, um, that the block controller worked. Uh, two of our buttons on the UCI should be able to toggle my sources by controlling the Atlona that's going to our NEC screen. There you Here go. we go. I believe we're currently on input two. So if I go to input one, voila! It Amazing! Ta-da! Back again. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, because a lot of what Block Controller provides is a bridge between putting blocks together and doing actual scripting. And Block Controller uh, facilitates that by basically allowing you to see the work that Block Controller did. So if you open up the Block Controller and you click Edit, it will, um, it will let you get access to the actual Lua code that's in there. So here's all the Lua that's being generated by Block Controller. A lot of this is just managing that TCP socket connection. But if we go to the very bottom, here's what it wrote based on those blocks we made for our controls. So you can see when control, in fact, it's right here. When control one is activated, we start an event handler, launches a function that writes this command, and then prints out, hey, button one was pressed. That's the exact same thing. In fact, I'm going to copy this. Exact same thing that we did over here in our Lua. Oh, no. Oh, I grabbed the wrong thing there. But I grabbed there. It's just right above it. So. Uh, if that makes sense to you, it's, yep. it's all the same um, code. It's just you can use one to learn the other uh, by toggling back and forth. Yep. So, Nate, we've got, uh, uh, first of all, Siobhan, we did not ask how long that took. I apologize. How, how, long, did it take? how long did that take? It was about four and a half minutes. About four and a half Which minutes. one was faster, block controller or this? Lua was actually faster. Uh, okay. If you know what you're doing. Fair enough. Well, we've got a little bit of extra time. I did want to show, uh, have Nate demonstrate how robust the UCI designer can be. We've, we've demonstrated little bits and pieces. Uh, we've built very basic shapes, and we've drug a, a background back in here. But um, there are a few additional uh, design things that you can do with buttons. Like, for instance, if, you, if you're good at Photoshop or you know somebody that's good at Photoshop and you want some custom buttons, you can skin these graphics on top of your QSIS elements. Sure. Uh, let me show you that. So let's take a look at these source buttons that we built. So we have these just these ugly gray buttons right now. If I want to put a special graphic on there, I would just select one of my buttons. We'll go to its properties. And we're going to change its style. Currently, it has a glossy style. I'm going to change that to an image style. And I'm going to uh, provide my own image. So let's load this source one on image. And when it's off, it can have a source one off image. We'll do the same thing for this second one. We'll make this source two on and source two off so that someone else made these buttons for us. We just got to kind of make them a little aspect ratio look a little bit better there. And now we've got our own custom images. Um, you can do a lot besides just, you know, if you don't want to use your own graphics, you could still use some of the graphics that are embedded in the software. So we have um, uh, icons, for instance. Uh, I could grab this, and I can grab an icon. Let's give it a power 
icon. These are all these all all native to the software, uh, and uh, maybe I'll make this a little bit larger, and maybe make it a little bit rounder. Uh, feels a little bit more friendly that way. These buttons over here, these icons are getting kind of dangerously large, so I'm going to add a padding to them. If I give them maybe 20 pixels of pad, then that shrinks down a little bit, maybe a little bit more. Uh, in fact, all of these buttons, I think they'd look a little bit prettier, too, if they were rounded out. So I'll give them uh, a roundness, and maybe sometimes I like to give them uh, a, a thick stroke that uh, will kind of give them a um, just sort of a, a border. That looks pretty good right there. Yeah. Um, one thing I didn't show you that I probably should is that we added three different layers onto this UCI, but we don't have a way of navigating between them yet. <laughs> Let's make sure that we do that. There's actually a number of different ways that you can add uh, navigation buttons into your UCI. Um, because I'm using layers, I'm going to use something that's called the layer controller, and I'm going to fade each layer on and off as I build this menu. So. If I go, let's make one last section here that's called uh, layer control. And I'm going to grab my UCI layer controller. If I tell this device to target the UCI that we have already built, which is the start the clock one, then inside of it, it automatically populates with all the layers that we can control. I'm going to expose the camera layer visibility, the environmental layer visibility, the video layer visibility. Uh, and I'm going to control these with a, another device. Because if I wanted to, I could make all these layers visible at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of reasons you might want to have lots of layers on, on your screen. In my case, I've built these sort of like individual pages, so I don't want that. Uh, I only want one on at a time. So I'm going to grab the selector tool. Selector tool gives you exclusive buttons, which work like radio buttons. You know, only one can be on at a time. So if I say I have three options, then I can put these three buttons on my UCI. Uh, I'm going to open up the selector one, two, and three control pins to control my UCI's visibility. And now we'll make these three buttons, and we'll put them on the side of our UCI like they are navigation tabs. So I'm going to call the first one camera, and we'll call the second one environment, and the last one is video. Obviously, those are all tiny. I could use uh, icons for these instead. Um, but for now, I'm just going to pick a larger font, something a little bit friendlier. Uh, in this case, I'm going to make them have them really dark a button when they're off, and I'll give them a nice happy blue when they're on. So happy. And let's take a look if that works. So I'm going to push that to the core. <coughs> And we should have full navigation control on our UCI as well as all of the controls for all the devices that we made throughout the day. Let's go wide here, Jason. Show all of our devices. And in fact, I'm going to make, uh, inside the software, I'm going to change their transition style so that they fade up and they fade down. Uh, and that's going to make our transitions a little yep. bit nicer in the real world. Uh, oh, one thing I should probably do is make sure that at the top, one of them, at least one of them, is active. Uh, there we go. And I want to make sure that my background. Oh, here I made a mistake. I made a mistake. How much time do we have left? I have one minute to fix it. You can do it. I have eight. We have eight minutes still. Wow, we flew through this one. Uh, when I added these buttons, I accidentally added them to the video page, which means that you only could navigate to another page if you were on the video page. So I'm going to cor correct that simply by grabbing those buttons and I'm going to drag them onto a different layer. And now. They looked visually the same on here, but they are now part of my background layer. I'll lock that off. So that way the background layer will always be visible, and I can see it from any of the pages. So that is what we'll push to our design, and we can go back to making sure it all works. That's a very nice presentation of the, the UCI here. So I'll touch my camera layer. And look, it fades up nicely. I can control my camera Bam. right there. I'll go to my environmental layer. I've got my shade control. I've got my lighting control. There's my lights. Go to the video layer. I have the ability still to change the sources on my uh, uh, touch panel over there. I can power it off entirely. Uh, I can open and close my tray. Voila! I think we did it all. We did it all with plenty of time to spare. Were there, were there questions? Did we leave time for questions? Is that, is that why we had I think uh, Siobhan has been relaying to me that Martin has been getting to all of those questions. Awesome. Uh, if you, we didn't get your question again, we're going to send a complete FAQ with all of the answers to those questions. If you want to learn 
how to do all this, I don't recommend watching this video. I recommend going to uh, training.qsc.com, taking all of the control training. You can learn all of this and more. Um, you will be receiving a link, though, if you do want to share this with other people or you want to watch it again, we'll be able to send that to you also. And then last and but not least, we're going to send you a PDF with a basic synopsis of everything that you just saw and kind of the, the journey that you need to go through to take the leap for uh, software-based control, which we hope that you do. Uh, in the meantime, uh, this is uh, Nate and Patrick signing off. Thanks a lot. Bye.